Okay, this is Michael Altos recording the first section, the first part of lecture number one on the fundamentals of clinical pharmacology. As an introduction, we want to think about a drug, a drug we use every day, like, for example, midazolam. And we're going to speak about this drug in the classroom session. And we know that midazolam is this drug that comes in a vial, and somewhere in that vial is a molecular structure that looks kind of like this. And we know that if you take a patient who's really anxious and you give them some midazolam, then they become calm and relaxed and they allow you to do things to them that their anxiety might prevent you from doing otherwise. And so this is a pretty, obviously, a pretty fundamental um, basic view of things. And we want to know more details. We want to know about where does the drug actually go and what has to happen for it to get there and for it to do its, its action. Uh, how long does it take for this to happen and what's next once it gets there? These are all questions that are fundamental to uh, pharmacology. And so we're talking about the fundamentals of pharmacology right now. And we're going to start with pharmacokinetics. Pharmacokinetics, it can be defined as what the body does to the drug, how the body takes the drug and, first of all, absorbs it into the body. It then distributes the drug throughout the body and redistribu redistributes it to various compartments. At some point, the drug reaches its target and it needs to be transferred across membranes to the target site of action, transported, and then once the drug has done its action, it's going to be metabolized, biotransformed in some way, and finally eliminated from the body. And this, in a nutshell, is what pharmacokinetics is about, what the body does to the drug. So we start with absorption, the first step of pharmacokinetics, and we know that absorption uh, relies a lot on the route of administration. How do we give this drug? And we know that drugs can be given intravenously, of course, but also intramuscularly, subcutaneously. They can be given orally or um, rectally. Uh, the IV and intramuscular kinds of administration are called parenteral, and the oral or rectal routes of administration are called enteral. And as we think about these different routes of administration, we see that we run into something called first-pass metabolism. The idea being that sometimes not all of the drug that you administer actually makes it to the target uh, organ or the target receptor. Some of the drug gets metabolized along the way, and we call this first-pass metabolism. For most drugs, when they're given parenterally, there is no first-pass metabolism, and we call that a bioavailability of one. Uh, however, when a drug is given orally or perhaps rectally, that blood flow goes to the liver, and some metabolism happens in the, in the liver before the drug can ever make it to the systemic circulation and to its site of action. And in that case, the bioavailability is less than one. Now, there are some exceptions. So we've compared oral with IV medications, but what about some IV drugs like fentanyl? So it turns out fentanyl has some metabolism in the lungs, and so therefore it has a first-pass metabolism, that is, a bioavailability less than one, even though it's an IV drug. We could say the same about succinylcholine, which is a drug given IV, and it's metabolized by pseudocholinesterase enzyme, which is in the plasma. So before the succinylcholine ever gets to its target, some of it is metabolized. Once the drug has been absorbed, we then start thinking about distribution, the movement of the drug throughout the body. And we see that a lot of the drugs we give in anesthesia have a very quick onset of action, and we want to understand why that is. At the same time, the drug has a very rapid recovery after a bolus. If you think about a single dose of propofol, the patient goes to sleep almost instantly, and if you would give no other drugs afterwards, they would wake up pretty quickly afterwards, and we want to understand why this happens. And this is a famous graph that you will encounter um, in most anesthesia textbooks in one form or another. And what this drug shows is, uh, starting with your plasma concentration, 100% of the drug is in your plasma, and as time goes on, the concentration in the plasma drops very rapidly, plummets actually, within the first minute. Where is that drug going? It's going into this first compartment, which we call the vessel-rich group, the VRG. And the vessel-rich group consists of our uh, organs that get the most cardiac output. You can see down here that even though they make up a very small percent of your body weight, these drugs make up about 75% of your cardiac output. So we're talking about the liver and the kidneys, the brain, and perhaps the lungs. And so these drugs tend to move very quickly into the vessel-rich group, and within a minute, there's a peak concentration in those organs, and then there's a rapid fall-off of concentration over the next several minutes, 
And by 10 minutes, that drug is almost absent from the vessel-rich group. Where has it gone? Is it metabolized? No, it's been redistributed once again, first into what we call the muscle group, and then later on into the fat group. Even though the fat group makes up a good amount of your body weight and the muscle group makes up a lot of your body weight, the cardiac output to those tissues is much less. In fact, your fat group gets uh, only about 6% of the cardiac output, and so it takes a very long time for that compartment to become saturated with drug. There's actually a fourth compartment not even shown on here called the vessel pore group. This would be like your bones and your teeth, other parts of your body which could make up a fair bit of body weight but have no real perfusion and no cardiac output. To think of this a different way, when you give a dose of drug, it goes into this central compartment, which is your plasma, your vessel-rich group. And it's true that the drug begins to get metabolized and eliminated, but most of the action is the drug being moved out of the central compartment into the peripheral compartment, this muscle group and this fat group. And there are constants that describe how quickly this happens, how quickly it moves back into the central compartment, and are these faster or slower compared to elimination. And so when we look at the concentration of drug in the plasma as a function of time, we see that it drops off pretty rapidly and then it starts to level off and drop a lot more slowly. This first rapid drop is called the distribution phase. This is the alpha phase. And this is the drug being redistributed from the plasma into the peripheral tissues, into the peripheral compartment. And then this second phase, which is still decreasing much more slowly, describes the elimination phase. <clears throat> As we talk about distribution, we should think about a concept called volume of distribution. This is a topic that confuses people a little bit, so we'll spend just a moment focusing on it. The volume of distribution allows us to quantify the extent of drug distribution, that is, how much is the drug being moved around to other tissues? What's the capacity of the body's tissues for this specific drug? And it depends on the patient's tissue mass, it depends on the affinity of the drug for that tissue, so every patient and every drug are going to have a slightly different uh, result. So for example, what we're really doing is describing the behavior of the drug in the body. So let's take a drug like fentanyl. If I inject 150 micrograms of fentanyl into someone and wait for a few minutes and then take a sample of their blood, I'll find a fentanyl concentration of about 0.4 nanograms per milliliter. We all know that concentration is mass divided by volume. So 150 micrograms divided by what volume makes a concentration of 0.4 nanograms per milliliter? It turns out to be 350 liters. That's the volume of distribution of fentanyl. Compare that if we took the same dose of pancuronium, a tiny, tiny dose, again 150 micrograms, and we sampled the patient's blood, we would have a concentration of 15 nanograms per milliliter. Much higher, implying a volume of distribution of only 10 liters. Now this is interesting because a patient's total body water is 42 liters. What this is telling me is that when I inject pancuronium, it doesn't even go to all of the patient's body water. It stays in some sub-compartment, probably just the vasculature and maybe the uh, extracellular fluid. Whereas fentanyl seems to go into this endless pit of volume. 350 liters is almost 10 times as much volume as it is in a patient. And this is telling me that the drug must be getting sequestered in some other compartment of the body. We're going to take a look at this uh, simulation over here for just a moment. And what this simulation is showing us, if I move on to module 2, is that when I inject 100 milligrams of drug into this patient's plasma, which is 5 liters, well 100 milligrams and 5 liters is 20 milligrams per liter. Uh, again, our volume of distribution is 5 liters. But suppose the drug redistributes into the extracellular fluid as well, which is another 10 liters. So now that 100 milligrams in 15 liters gives us a concentration of only 6.7 milligrams per liter. And the drug can redistribute further into the intracellular fluid, into muscle, and even into fat. And now when I take my drug sample out and I sample it, the concentration is only 0.09 milligrams per liter, implying a volume of distribution of over 1,000 liters. Now obviously the patient doesn't have 1,000 liters of anything in their body but this is sort of a virtual volume. It's telling us that the drug is so fat soluble, it's so drawn to the fat, that the amount left in the serum is as if the patient had over a thousand liters of water in their body. So you can see that the volume of distribution really describes the behavior of drug in the body and tells us about the extent 
of drug distribution. This is a good time if you have any questions that you're not clear about to jot them down for discussion in class or you can email me about them and make sure that you remember them so we can clarify these points for you later. And at this point we're going to stop this part of the video and you can continue with the next part two on another file.